us that those whom he has chosen will be on his side. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to our text that we read just a few moments ago. We have been talking about the call of God and the enablement of God. And we've seen how when God called Moses, as he does here in this chapter 3, God also enabled him and gave him promises and proofs concerning his call. We saw that for Moses that included various miraculous gifts and abilities which were manifested both before Pharaoh and all the people of Egypt and then as Moses led the children of Israel out across the Red Sea and into the wilderness where they spent 40 years wandering because they would not believe God and because they rebelled against him 10 times. It's given to us in the New Testament as a warning, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, reminds us that in the same way that God dealt with Israel in the Old Testament, he will also deal with the church, and so we better not put him to the test, better not rebel against him, better not ignore what he has done for us so that we might serve him. God has given us gifts to do that with, and we've been talking about how when God called us and when he enabled us by his Spirit, to enter into fellowship with him through salvation, they also gifted us by the Spirit of God to serve him. We've pointed out how in the charismatic movement there's a great deal of confusion, and we'll be talking about that a little bit later on today, because God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches, and Paul says that very clearly to us in the New Testament. The seven sign gifts are no longer being given. They are being counterfeited, They are counterfeited by the world, they are counterfeited by the flesh, and they are counterfeited by the devil. But the Holy Spirit is no longer giving those seven sign gifts of apostle, prophet, healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the gift of knowledge, which was the ability to receive brand new revelation from God 
and there are 17 mysteries, things that were not revealed in the Old Testament. There are 17 new mysteries that are revealed in the New Testament. That related to the gift of knowledge. But we find that there are 15 service gifts, not sign gifts, but service gifts, which God has entrusted to the church that we might be able to serve him and whereby we might be able to edify, Ephesians chapter 4, that's the word that means to build up one another. We've seen already eight of those service gifts, the gift of evangelist, pastor, teacher, teacher, governments, ruling, helps, faith, and wisdom. Last week we spent a good deal of time on those two gifts, faith and wisdom, because of two things. Number one, both are what I call every believer gifts. The scripture specifically says so. That everyone who is a Christian has received those particular spiritual gifts and now it's our responsibility to develop them through the study of scripture, walking by faith, asking for wisdom, and growing in grace. Secondly, these are not just every believer gifts, but they are foundational gifts. You have them because they are necessary for your spiritual growth and they are also necessary for you to exercise every other gift. You cannot exercise your other spiritual gifts without exercising faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. We must have wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is as a wave of the sea, driven with wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. In other words, you can't get any answers to prayer unless you have wisdom. You get wisdom through the study of the word, and then as you obey the word, as you walk by faith, God gives you wisdom how to apply it, and he answers your prayers because you're asking prayers that are in harmony with his word, with his will, and with his character. All other prayer is carnal prayer, and it will receive a no answer from God. The devil may answer it for you, but not God. God does not give yes answers to carnal prayer. You need faith and you need wisdom. God has given it. He has provided it. Faith is the gift of God, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. How important it is for each one of us to learn to walk by faith. He has given it to us. It's a matter of exercise and to ask for wisdom because he'll give it liberally. He'll give it generously so that we might know how to apply his word. God never works in a vacuum. God works on the basis of Scripture. The Holy Spirit never moves you in any direction that is contrary to Scripture. Scripture is the foundation. Faith is complete confidence in the Word of God. You look at the description of faith, the evidence of things seen, the hope of the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 11, chapters 1 and 2. And what do you discover? You discover that every hero of faith listed in that chapter heard the word of God, believed the word of God, and acted on the word of God. Faith is complete confidence in the word of God. Saving faith is created in the elect by what the sovereign God reveals himself to be. Memorize that. Meditate on that. Act on that. When you know what the Bible says and you refuse to obey what the Bible says, not only are you not walking by faith, you are under the chastening hand of God and he will spank his children. So that was what we saw about faith. And we need to remember that faith is connected to wisdom in that passage I quoted just a moment ago in James chapter 1. If you're lacking wisdom, ask, but you must ask in faith. Otherwise, you don't get any other prayer requests answered. You can ask for wisdom, but you must ask in faith without wavering. And that's what brought us to wisdom last week. Wisdom is different than knowledge, and divine wisdom is different than divine knowledge. The gift of knowledge related to new revelation. Wisdom relates to the ability to understand what God has given us in his word. Wisdom, as you read this, is something that a non-believer does not have. He can memorize verses, he can gain, gain facts, but he does not have divine wisdom. Because divine wisdom is a gift from God to those who are his children. Very important for us to understand that, that if you want wisdom, you must go back 
to the scriptures. We saw that wisdom is stated as a spiritual gift in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 and 8. We saw that it is stated as a gift that grows with exercise and practice. You might have great talent, for example, on the piano. But if you don't practice, you sound horrible, even if you're gifted and you bang your way through it. Arthur Rubinstein, one of the great pianists of the past, once said, and he was considered the number one in the world in his day, he once said, if I don't practice for a day, I know it. If I don't practice for two days, my wife knows it. If I don't practice for three days, the world knows it. Dear folks, living by faith, walking by faith, walking in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time, is a daily activity whereby the Christian is exercising spiritually so that he or she might fulfill what God has called him or her to do. Wisdom. The gift of wisdom gives every believer the capacity to understand and apply the Word of God. It is a gift that expands through illumination as the believer studies and applies the Word of God. The believer is commanded to ask God for wisdom in applying the Word of God, and it is always linked with faith, which is complete confidence in the Word of God. Wisdom does not doubt Scripture. Listen to that again. Wisdom does not doubt Scripture. There is other kinds of wisdom from the world, the flesh, and the devil. James says so. We'll quote those passages in a few minutes. The wisdom that is from above does not doubt Scripture. It believes Scripture even when Scripture seems illogical or impossible. That's where we get to faith and walking on the basis of what God said, not what the world said. Wisdom is stated as a gift that grows with exercise and practice. Wisdom is stated as a gift for growing in the knowledge of the will of God. We saw that in Colossians 1, 9 last week. Wisdom is stated as that which can be used for the glory of God. We saw last week that the active use and fullness of wisdom is required for church leadership. Men who do not have biblical wisdom should never be placed in church leadership. That means they are men who know the word of God, who are walking by faith, and who are properly applying the word of God on a daily basis. That's what we learned out of Acts chapter 6. We saw that divine wisdom is irresistible. We saw that divine wisdom is not the same thing as human wisdom. We saw that divine wisdom is not comprehensible or learnable by unsaved men. And you recall, we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and moving into chapter 2, that there are three kinds of people in the world. There's the natural man, that is the unsaved man, who cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They don't understand them because they're spiritually discerned. There is the spiritual man, that is the Christian who is walking by faith and walking in wisdom. And there is the carnal man, the fleshly man. That's the saved man, but who is still living as though he were unsaved. He's walking in the flesh instead of walking in the spirit. And Paul spends a great deal of time talking about that. And there are many Christians in the church today, they've, they've got their uh, ticket to heaven, they've managed to grab the fire escape, but that's the end of their Christian experience. They're carnal. And Paul excoriates the Corinthians for being carnal instead of being spiritual. Well, they're saved, but 1 Corinthians is designed to ream the church at Corinth out because of their carnal activity and their carnal lifestyle. The things that they're willing to put up with in the church. Serious business. We saw that divine wisdom is not comprehensible or learnable by unsaved men. We saw that the restriction on divine wisdom is perhaps best stated in the Proverbs, which says, Wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no heart to it? You must have a heart for wisdom. You can't buy it. The only way that you get a heart for wisdom is through faith in Christ. And then he gives you wisdom 
as you study his word and as you apply his word the way that God designed it to be applied, not the way that our president has tried to apply it to support homosexuality. We saw the divine wisdom is given to the saved by the Holy Spirit. It's not something that you get on your own or that you work up. It is the Spirit of God who illuminates the Word of God. He is the one who gives us understanding. He is the one who gave us the spiritual gifts in the first place. We saw that carnal Christians will not exercise the gift of wisdom and therefore will not be wise. We saw the divine wisdom is the key to living the Christian life, not worldly wisdom. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation, that is, our manner of life in the world, that's the way of Christians to live, that's the Christian lifestyle, and more abundantly, to you, word. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you, let him show out of a good conversation, that is, out of a good manner of life, his works with meekness of wisdom. You cannot live the Christian life in any manner that is pleasing to God without wisdom. And that's why James exhorts us to ask for wisdom. And Paul exhorts us to walk in wisdom, redeeming the time. Don't waste your time. You can't waste time anyway. You're only wasting your life. God has given you a certain period of time in which to live. That is your life. And the more of it you waste, the more of your life you are wasting and you will have to give an account before a holy God someday for what he has entrusted to you and what you have wasted. Oh, dear people, I love you so much. And I want so desperately to see you to walk with Christ. All the time. All the time. Don't waste your life. How much is left of it? You may be young, you may be old, but none of us knows if we'll live till tonight. The last thing that we looked at last week was Colossians 3.16. We saw that wisdom is gained from the Word, and when it is gained from the Word, it results in two things that are mentioned in Colossians 3.16. It results in teaching sound doctrine... And it results in godly music. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. There are so many foolish Christians today in the area of music. They think that anything goes, as long as it's got, quote, Christian words to it, it's okay. Dear people, that's not what the Apostle Paul says in this verse. And I want to begin with that last verse and make some applications out of the book of James. Let me read the verse again. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. He mentions two things. He mentions teaching and and admonishing by way of music. Now, this is the application. Suppose you were really stupid in terms of spiritual things out there, didn't know a whole lot of Bible doctrine, had only been a Christian for, say, a week. Would you be able to discern truth and error? Would you be able to discern music that pleases God and music that does not please God? The answer is yes. If you had no other indicators, such as direct heresy and content, like the denial of the deity of Christ, the way to identify worldly, carnal, and satanic wisdom, including worldly, carnal, and satanic teaching, and worldly, carnal, and satanic music, as contrasted with divine wisdom, is by its fruits. And James says so. I'm going to take you to the passage in a moment. In music in particular, people argue that the words are not bad, and therefore the music is okay. Let me read to you what James says. Who is a wise man, and endued with knowledge among you? Who really knows the scripture, and who really knows how to apply it well? What's it going to result in? 
Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is, now listen to the three things, earthly, sensual, devilish. Earthly, what's that? The world. Sensual, what's that? The flesh. Devilish, what's that? The devil. Your three key enemies, you're going to be able to discern them in certain ways here. The world, the flesh, and the devil. There is a pseudo-wisdom that comes from each of those sources. This wisdom descendeth not from above. There's only one kind of wisdom that descends from above. That's divine wisdom. The wisdom that descendeth not from above is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. He makes a point of it. The capstone of divine wisdom is purity. The capstone of wisdom is purity. People argue this way or that way that they can go so far and then they can stop at this point. I can take one little sip here and it won't lead me to be an alcoholic. The wisdom that is from above is first pure. Oh, well, I'm out on a date and I can do this and that and the other thing as long as I don't go all the way. The wisdom that's from above is first pure. Don't forget it. Anything else that wants to lead you a different direction is earthly, sensual, devilish. Purity. You see, we serve a holy God. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He never directs us into that which is borderline. In God's perspective, there are no gray areas. Remember that. God's word is a piercing light. There are no gray areas. God's word has dealt with every sin conceivable to man. There are no gray areas. God's word has dealt with every motive of man. There are no gray areas. If you take time to truly study 1 John, you will discover that everything is black or white. It's darkness or light. It's truth or error. There are no gray areas from God's perspective. The reason we think there are gray areas is because we don't know God's word. We serve a holy God and the wisdom that is from above is first pure. There are no gray areas. Then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Now, I want to go through that passage and point out to you that there are 14 positive words in that passage that would tell us, since we're dealing with divine wisdom, the wisdom that is from above, in contrast that the wisdom that is not from above, but is worldly, sensual, and devilish, going back then to that passage in Colossians, which talks about the word of Christ dwelling in us richly, in all wisdom, and how that wisdom will produce a certain kind of teaching and a certain kind of music. There are many other things that it does as well, but those happen to be two key issues in the church today. I want to take those two passages and put them together and say, well, what does that teach us about how we can put teaching to the test and how we can put music to the test? Because those are both connected there in Colossians 3.19 with divine wisdom. The first positive that we look at is biblical knowledge. That's the edification of the believers. 
Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? The man who is wise and has the knowledge is going to communicate it to the body of Christ. He is going to seek to teach them sound doctrine. He will be a man who, as the head of his home, wants to communicate sound doctrine to his children. He is a man who will be on the alert for false doctrine because he knows the scriptures. Not merely knowing theology, what others have written about the scriptures, but a man who knows the scriptures. Our primary focus, dear people, should be on the scriptures, not on what everybody's written about them or summaries of them. Our focus is on the scripture. That is where divine knowledge comes from. Number two, a godly lifestyle. Second thing he mentions is let him show out of a good conversation. That's a good manner of life. The second key to wisdom is not merely that he knows something about the Bible, but that it has affected his life. Is he a wise man and endued with knowledge? Let him show out of a good conversation, that is, out of a godly manner of life, his works with meekness of wisdom. Number one, biblical knowledge. Number two, a godly lifestyle. Number three, good works that are pleasing to God. Let him show his works with meekness of wisdom. You know, the word of God makes it clear that there are tests for good works. Not everything that men call good works are good works. Good works must be done, first of all, to the glory of God. If they're done to bring glory to the flesh, they are not good works. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. This is found all over the New Testament. Good works, the first test for good works, are, are they being done to the glory of God? Test number two for good works. Are they being done in obedience to the word of God? Anything that is disobedient to the word of God is not a good work. For example, John tells us over in his little epistle of 2 John, about what is the doctrine of Christ. Who Jesus is, what he did. That's the person work of Christ, the doctrine of Christ. He says, if there come any unto your house that bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Now there are Christians today who have rationalized that verse away by saying, oh, okay, the Jehovah's Witnesses came to my door. And... Um, I decided that to try to use friendship evangelism, I would bring them into my house, serve them some coffee and cookies, and then we would dialogue about the Bible. Do they bring the doctrine of Christ, the Christ of Scriptures? They do not. They do not believe that Jesus Christ is indeed infinite God and a member of the Trinity, which they deny. They believe that he is a created being, Michael the Archangel. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed, that is, have a nice day, old way of saying, you know, hope you have a great day today. Frankly, I hope they have a horrible day that day. Do I really want them to go to my neighbor's house, knock on the door and convert my neighbors to Jehovah's Witnesses? Neither bid him Godspeed, because it says, For he that biddeth him Godspeed, even if you say, Have a nice day to him, is a partaker of his evil deeds. People, that's serious business. Forget the modern theories of evangelism. Stick with scripture. Oh, you can stand outside and talk to him and show him that his... You know, interpretation of John 1.1 1, 1 is nuts and that it is absolutely contrary to the Greek. 
which is, says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And they'll try to take their interlinear Bibles and say the Word was a God in it. Well, I'm not going to give you a Greek lesson right now. I think I've talked about this in the past. But understand that that means that Jesus was by his very nature of being God. That's a special construct in Greek that guarantees that the nature of Jesus Christ is God himself. Good works that are pleasing to God. Test number one, is it glorifying to God? Test number two, is it obedient to the word of God? Test number three, is it in the power of the spirit of God? If you're doing it in the flesh, it is not a good work. Paul says, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. You cannot please God with the works of the flesh. So the third thing that James tells us here about wisdom is not only it will communicate biblical knowledge, not only will it produce a godly lifestyle, but it will also produce works that are pleasing to God. The fourth word that he uses is meekness. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power under control. Moses is spoken of as the meekest man on the face of the earth. Moses was not Mr. Milk Toast. Moses was a powerful man. Moses had strength. Moses had a lot of knowledge. Moses had wisdom. Moses had direction. Moses had empowerment. Moses was willing to stand up to the children of Israel when they wanted to stone him and say, you know, you've not griped against us. You've griped against God. You've got a problem with him. Hey, Lord, take over. Meekness. You have power. The question is, is it under control? You have power that has been provided to you by God Almighty himself through the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. Is he, the Holy Spirit, in control of your life? You've heard me preach on that in relation to the filling of the Spirit. Does he control every area of your life or are there certain areas of your life where you have resisted and said, you're not going to control that because I like that. It titillates my flesh. Meekness. Purity, there we have the same thing that we discovered in verse 17. The wisdom that is from above is first pure. Peace, here we find internal peace. He's going to talk about external peace at the end of the verse, but here it's internal peace. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable. Is your life filled with agitation? You're always worrying about something? Do things push you this way and that way and this way and that way? You're back to James chapter 1. You see, if you don't have the perfect central point of peace in Christ, you will be like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he should receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. How's your peace these days? We see ourselves surrounded by the enemy. Is there fear in your heart as you look forward to this upcoming election? We see ourselves perhaps on the brink of losing some source of income. Is there agitation in our spirit because of that? We see trouble with children or grandchildren. Are we worried or are we trusting the living God to sovereignly work in their lives? Gentle is the next thing, gentleness. Oh, how often we want to be pushy. How often we want to make sure that we get our way. Remember how the Lord Jesus Christ lived and how he walked with those who were his own as a shepherd leads his sheep, not as a shepherd drives his sheep. 
gentleness. Easy to be entreated. That means a listening and a compassionate spirit. Many years ago, I read a book called The Listening Ear, written by an unsaved man, but it was eye-opening because I suddenly began to realize he didn't know it, but he's talking about scripture. Being willing to listen instead of always having an answer in advance before anyone gets through with their sentence. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him, says the book of Proverbs. Easy to be entreated. Someone comes to you with a petition. Wisdom says that you will listen, that you will hear it out until you know both sides of a story. Fullness of mercy. Oh, look at that. It says full of mercy. When God extends grace to us, he extends it as we are guilty. Think of two G's, grace and guilty. When he extends mercy to us, he extends it to us in the midst of the results of our sin. That is, as we are miserable. Sin produces misery. Grace is extended to us as we are guilty, G and G. Mercy is extended to us as we are miserable, <laughs> the results of our sin. He has mercy on us. He's already extended his grace to us through Christ, but he also extends mercy to us. His grace continues on into that flood of mercy that reaches down to us in our miserable condition. The man who is wise will reflect this character quality of Christ, full of mercy. And good fruits. Do you know what wisdom results in? Because wisdom is connected to walking by faith. It results in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. We see that some of the fruit of the Spirit is actually included in this list that James is discussing here. Are you wise? One of the ways to tell is by your fruit. Are you bearing fruit? What fruit are you bearing? Are you bearing consistently and on a regular basis love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, the wisdom that is from above is full of mercy and good fruits. The next thing he says it has is it's without partiality. Without partiality means that it's, it's got a level unbiased dealing with situations in life. Without partiality, it doesn't take sides. It doesn't uh, decide in advance where it's going and go there whether or not the facts bear it out or not. It's without hypocrisy. That is, it's forthright. Wisdom that's from above doesn't beat around the bush. It deals with issues forthrightly, although gently, because he's already talked about gentleness, honestly, in ways that are pleasing to Christ. And it says, the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of righteousness is holy living. Wisdom that is from above produces holy living, the fruit of righteousness. And it is sown in peace of them that make peace. Not only do we have the internal peaceableness listed above, which is going to be contrasted with internal proofs that someone does not have biblical wisdom, but there will be an external peacemaking activity. It is sown in peace of them that make peace. Fourteen things that characterize the positive words that characterize biblical wisdom. Now take those and apply it to the things that Paul has talked about in Colossians. Teaching. Is it divine wisdom that you are hearing taught when you listen to the radio, television, or even this preacher? When you read the books and the things that you come across in your daily activities? 
And you think, boy, that sure is a good psychological principle. I think I will try to apply that and manipulate somebody. The teaching, does it reflect those 14 things? How about the music that you think is okay? Does it reflect biblical knowledge and the edification of believers? Does it result in and produce a godly lifestyle? Does it result in and produce good works that are pleasing to God? Is it a manifestation of meekness and of purity? And does it produce internal peace? Is it music that produces in you a spirit of gentleness? Does it produce in you a listening and compassionate spirit for those who are lost? Is it something that will show forth through itself and in you fullness of mercy and good fruits and produce level, unbiased dealings? Does it forthrightly deal with sin? Is there hypocrisy about it? Does it produce the fruit of righteousness? Does it produce external peacemaking activity? Pretty good tests for wisdom. Now let me give you very quickly, I see our time is two minutes from now. I'll give you the negatives and we'll cover them, the Lord willing, in detail next week. In addition to the opposite of the 14 positive terms, you could look at the opposite of each of those, we'll not take time for that right now, used to describe godly wisdom and thus godly teaching and godly music in the church as stated in Colossians 3.16. Does the teaching or supposed wisdom result in the following? Here are the negative words. Internal bitterness, he talks about bitterness in your hearts. See, as contrasted with the peace that is in your hearts. Internal envy, envying, that's also connected to that phrase, in your hearts. Internal strife, that's also connected to the phrase, in your hearts. Does it produce pride? Think about the music and the musicians who are performing contemporary Christian music. Because he says, glory not is don't be proud. Does it produce deception and lies? Does it attempt to frame lies into the truth? Very serious issues. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Does it mimic and imitate the world's teaching like psychology or the world's music? So much of contemporary Christian music is merely a poor takeoff on somebody who has made it big in the world. In fact, a number of years ago I saw a book that had gone through and listed all the contemporary Christian musicians and said their music is like, and then they named a popular secular group, in some cases demonic groups, that these Christian musicians were imitating but transforming it into, quote, Christian music by adding somewhat Christian words although there's a lot of so-called crossover music where you don't know who the he is that is being talked about in the song, but the person singing it is madly in love with whoever he is. And so for the Christian, it sounds like Jesus. And for the unsaved world, it sounds like whoever your current boyfriend is. Dear people, that is not biblical wisdom, and that is not biblical music. Mimicking and imitating the world's teaching of psychology or the world's music. Does it produce sensuality and stimulation of the flesh? He says it's sensual music. Is it earthly? Is it sensual? Sensual music, seductive rhythms, seductive tempos, seductive style of performance, the clothing of the performance, the stage lighting, the strobes, and so on, designed to bring you into a state of hypnotism, whereby your 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 blood begins to roll up and you're stimulated in the flesh. That is not godly music. The wisdom that descendeth not from above is earthly. It's sensual. It's devilish. And so is the music that descends not from above. It is earthly. It is sensual. And it is devilish. Number nine. Does it lead to occult and demonic practices and doctrine like much that is going on in the modern charismatic movement where many of those folks are controlled by demonic forces? And I hate to say that, but it's true. God's word makes that very clear. Is it like the church at Thyatira? And we won't have time to read that passage. We'll start there next week. But Thyatira, they were real believers, but they had let demonic things and carnal things come into their church. Well, we'll have to stop with that. Your people, wisdom controls the way a Christian lives. 
Without wisdom and without faith, you have no basis for the Christian life. And you can ask God for wisdom to give you understanding of his word so that you can apply it accurately to the real time life that you're living. And as you do so, it will produce a life that is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. Gracious Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. Too often we know the theory we know the principles, but we've never put it into real life. We've studied how to use the gun. We know the name of all the parts. We know which size bullet goes into the gun. We've even put bullets into the gun and taken bullets out of the gun, but we've never shot at a target. Father, help us. Since you have given us all the necessary information, you've given us the instruction manual, you have given us the gifts to enable us to use the instruction manual. You have given us the opportunities in life whereby we can apply the instruction manual to real life. Cause us, Father, to have biblical wisdom that not only thinks about it, but which produces a life that pleases Christ. Help us to walk by faith, not merely to stand in the faith. We commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen.